Have you ever had that moment when you suddenly question who you really are? I have it all the time in Spain. Didn't know any Spanish before arriving. And then suddenly I felt, how am I going to be myself? I can't even tell a joke. And uh, yeah, that felt flat. Good. I can't even do it in English. Uh, but like I'd, I'd, gone, um, I'd gone about a few weeks in and we had a language tutor and I decided I'd start writing a journal, you know, to, to practice and get it reviewed by her. And my, uh, Tanya had been a bit sick uh, that week, so I decided to say something simple but cute. Tanya is sick but really beautiful. Nice, huh? Apparently what I wrote was, Tanya is a sick, handsome male dog. (laughs) How was I supposed to be myself and know who I really was? But it got worse. Like seven months in, I'd been meeting up with this guy from church, chatting all the time in Spanish, doing great. He runs into Tanya on the bus and says, you know, I really like Mike. He's really quiet and serious. Tanya just like burst out in laughter on the inside, of course, because like you you really don't know Mike. But I'm like, I can't be myself. I just want to shout and tell some jokes. Anyway, it's hard, isn't it, when you don't feel like you can be yourself, when you start questioning who you are. Makes me think of my story as a Christian. My mum is a, a Christian. She'd been praying for me since before I can remember. And so since before I can remember, I've trusted that Jesus was my saviour, that he died for me, that I, in him I, I'd been freed, I was forgiven. All God's work. But then well, as I got to high school, particularly, my friends would start picking up the inconsistencies with the way I was living. And they'd say, aren't you saying you're a Christian? Doesn't your God say that you should do this or that? And I was like, oh man, this is challenging the way that I'm living. Am I really believing this for myself? Is this me? Am I going to actually treat Jesus as not only my Savior, but my Lord as well? There are a lot of really people, help, really helpful people at my church and then at university who started reading the Bible with me, helping me to read it for myself too, to discover and own who I truly was, a child of God. I look at the story of Spanish teenagers and for them, I see it's even harder than what it was for me. They've come from Christian churches, uh, their parents are, are Christian, but maybe they're the only Christian in their schools. They get mocked even by their their teachers sometimes. Their friends will say, like this Christian thing you talk about, isn't it unfair? Why do you keep saying no to everyone? Isn't your God a God of love? They start to question the Bible, what they've been taught to believe. They they have all these doubts. And they, they find that their church self is maybe a bit different from their school self. And then that's even different from their faceogram self or whatever that thing is. And then they struggle to reflect their true self, to discover who they really are. What's your story? Maybe you've seen things changing around you. You've seen the whole marriage debate go on. Maybe people from your churches were really involved in a campaign against it and and you just saw them saying no to other people and talking about all their fears that they had and then you heard your friends saying all these things that sounded kind of reasonable and good and maybe you're going maybe that's a better alternative a better story maybe you're doubting and you're starting to think is this me one John's kind of weird too isn't it you you hit parts of the bible and you go this is weird do i really believe this? Am I really sticking to it? But if we're willing to stop and listen to what God has said here, we'll see that John is asking our question, our big question, do you know who you really are? It's the same question he's been asking what we saw last night from chapter 1, that the word of life has appeared and he's proclaimed it. It's Jesus the Christ and that in him we have fellowship, that we have a new identity. And he says that again at the start of verse 7 or in verse 7, you'll see of chapter 2. 
the message you have heard. It's something we're sticking to from the beginning, an old command. But it's also a new command in the sense that once you recognize that identity, that light can't mix with darkness, you've got to shine. You're going to start showing all those things in the way that you live. But for these Christians that he was writing to, these readers, it wasn't easy. There were some amongst them who were trying to lead them astray. You saw that in verse 26. They were telling them to love something else, a false god. Maybe they were starting to doubt, is this the true story, this thing that we've heard? Now, our text for tonight, though, paints a beautiful answer to their question and ours. Who are you really? I'll summarize what I think it's saying in one big idea. You were born to remain in the Christ. You were born to remain in the Christ. Now, I'm going to go through various supporting ideas to show you why I got to that as the summary, and I'll show you where I got those from in the text. And if you've got then questions about how I got there, please ask them later. But I'm going to then summarize it again and again, saying that you were born to remain in the Christ. John gets straight to his point. The real story of life. If you're going to answer, who am I really? You've got to know what you're here for. The meaning of life. Our purpose. And so the first supporting idea is that the real story of life is to live for Jesus. I see this first supporting idea in chapter 2, verse 12 to 14. If you've closed your Bibles, open them again, check it out for yourselves. You'll see he's writing to three groups of people that he repeats a second time. Let's see if we can see them together. You shout it out when I get there. I am writing to you. Dear children. That's good, but you, you kind of got there. Then second, I am writing to you. This is verse 13. I am writing to you. Fathers, good. I am writing to you. Young men, young people we heard before. Let's go through that, though. That's kind of weird, right? Because is he just writing to boys? No. He he uses the first one, dear children. And have you noticed that he uses that throughout the rest of the letter, too, to refer to all his readers? So, So this is a general thing. So there's something maybe a bit figurative going on here with what he's saying. You'll see it in what he says about these children, Because, he says, the first one, their sins have been forgiven on account of his name in Jesus. And then the second time, he says, it's because they know the Father. So they're not literal babies. They couldn't read a letter if they were. They're kind of, well, that's that's what happens when you start your Christian journey, right? Your your sins get forgiven, you, you meet God, and so you can say that you know the Father. It's amazing, right? That's the start of the journey. Well, then you get to fathers, and that's the end of the journey. Those in society who are kind of mature. And and you see what it says about them. It says the same thing twice. You know him who is from the beginning. As in, they've been persevering, sticking it out. That's the end of the journey, to arrive and be with Christ forever. So he's writing to baby Christians and to mature Christians but how do you get there? What happens in the middle? Well, young men need to persevere. You've got this young men thing. That was the the term that they used to say those in society who were kind of maturing on a path to maturity. And so the Christian version of that is that in order to get to the end, you need to overcome the Come on. You need to overcome the evil one. That's right. Now, I don't think this has already happened. It says you have overcome the evil one. But I think what's happening here is he's saying this is what's unfolding before us. As in it has to happen if you're going to get to the end. You start as a baby Christian having known Jesus. The goal is to stay faithful to the end of your life in Jesus. And so what has to happen in the middle, kind of like a train tracks that go from the start to the destination, is you must 
overcome the evil one. Setting aside anything else other than Jesus that might take you off those tracks from getting to the end. At first year uni, I had this great dream. It was to be a full-time movie director, a full-time singer in a band, and a full-time youth pastor. I just really like youth group games, I guess, or something. I, th- I thought it would be really fun. The weird thing is, though, it was like, missionary? No way. Why? Too uncomfortable. I, I wasn't prepared to think about that. It didn't set... But then, as I was confronted with God's word, with his story, well, I couldn't put myself at the center anymore. That's where Jesus belongs. And so my life needed to be about Jesus and start again. Suddenly, something like mission came back on the table. I had to overcome my selfishness. What about you? What are you going to need to overcome in order to stick at it and stick to Jesus. The good news is that it doesn't depend on us. John breaks his formula in that last bit of verse 14. I write to you in the first one, it's young people because you have overcome the evil one, and then he does it again. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God lives in you, and you have overcome the evil one. It's that same word from chapter 1. It's Jesus, the Christ. As in, this isn't your story or my story. This is his story that he invites us into. And it means that he's in control and we can depend on him. Some of you have heard that I, I get these random hiccups. They're like maybe five a day and it'll just randomly happen at any given point in time. I reckon that's God's kindness to me. It's these little reminders that I'm actually not in control at all. And Jesus is in control. So if I ever do one in your presence while on camp, just say to me straight away, Jesus is in control. And then we'll all remind each other whose story it really is. This is Jesus' story. And you only live the real story of life, your purpose, your meaning, when you overcome in Jesus, when you live for Jesus. And that's the first reason why you were born to remain in the Christ. With living for Jesus is the real story of life. What's the false story? Second supporting idea, the false story is to live for anything other than Jesus. I see John start this in verse 15 of chapter 2. Check it out in your Bibles. Do not love the world or anything in the world. What's the world here? It's another story, right? You see it in verse 16. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. So he's not saying that God's creation is bad. It's it's what we turn it into. It's our lust of the the flesh, what we discover as we we touch. Anyone notice that? There's a bit of like dessert here. It's chocolate. That looks awesome. What? It feels kind of... Sorry, I'm supposed to be giving a talk. I kind of forgot about that for a moment. Um, It's the lust of the the eyes, what what we see and crave. That looks pretty good, actually. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, it's, it's, the, it's the pride of life, like what we, we hoard and boast about when we decide that something else is maybe better. See, so that's, that just looks, I'm just going to, um, well, really good is that. Like, the chocolate. Sorry. <laughs> it's really gross watching someone else eat. It's, it's what we do with God's creation, isn't it? You see, we make for ourselves other gods that so fill our vision that we get distracted from the main story. 
And we end up saying that it's better. Our pride takes over. And they become our story rather than living for Jesus. But they pass away. And you're left with nothing. Verse 17, the world and its desires pass away. But whoever does the will of God lives forever. I want to tell you about Pablo. I've changed his name. Uh, he'd become a Christian just after we got to Valencia and he'd received the message uh, with joy. He was even sharing it with friends, with family. I started meeting with him uh, and another guy to read the Bible and share life. But he slowly started to drift away. He'd slowly been pursuing what he saw and touched. And as his life became more evident to others, he was confronted with the way that he was living. But his pride caused him to shut off most of the Christian voices in his life. And little by little, he had returned to his love of the world, to a lie that is passing away. At this point, we can have a look at what the Antichrist is. Sounds like a kind of horror movie, right? But then John says, no, don't worry, it's okay. Actually, many Antichrists have come. And you're like, what? Many Antichrists? It's like multiple horror movies. I what, is it? What, what does he mean? The funny thing is, is that he, the bigger thing for him is that Jesus is coming back. That's where he gets to in verse 28, right? And what did Jesus say to his disciples was going to happen before he came back? That people were going to try and lead them astray. And that's what John is saying to the guys here. They're, they're trying to lead you astray, these people amongst you. And so the Antichrist for him is nothing that spectacular. It's simply anti-Christ. They, that's what he says in verse 22, right? Look at verse 22. Whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ, denying the Father and the Son, they are the Antichrists. It's like, oh, well, that's simple. But you guys are being confronted with so many other stories. People saying things like, God wants you to be happy, so do what makes you happy. God is love, so love in whatever way you want. The Bible is just trying to cage you, so just take the good bits. But they're all false stories. Because they say you can live for something other than Jesus. They are anti-Christ. But that's not what you were made for. You were born to remain in the Christ. So it's time to figure out who you really are. You call yourself a Christian, are you? Our third supporting idea sums up who a Christian is. A child of God who lives with Jesus as their king. I see this in what John goes on to say in verse 20. Check it out in your Bibles. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. Again, what's this anointing thing? It sounds kind of weird. Like anointing, right? I get what that is. That's when you put shampoo on your head. You anoint yourself with shampoo, right? He's not talking about shampoo. He's talking about an anointing that's from the Holy One, so probably the Holy Spirit. But it doesn't seem like it's some sort of superpower, like the anointing that Captain Marvel gets from energy that enables her to fly through spaceships. Look at the rest of the verse. This anointing seems to be related to knowing the truth. So in verse 23, this truth is acknowledging that Jesus is the Christ. That's the truth. Jesus is the Christ, the Son. So what does that mean? What does it mean to acknowledge Jesus is the Christ? Well, you know Christ is not his last name. It's his title. So what the guys saw in the biblical theology uh, seminar earlier it's that he is the king that God has promised through the whole Old Testament who's going to rule the universe forever. So what you're saying as you acknowledge that Jesus is this Christ, this king, you're actually changing kingdoms. You are stopping rejecting God as king. You're recognizing that you're not the king and then you're living for Jesus as your king from that point onwards. So how do you come to recognize that truth? You get anointed. That is, 
God the Holy Spirit reveals this truth to you. Here's how I got to that. John uses a similar word to anointing in chapter 9 of his gospel when Jesus heals the blind man. What he does is he anoints the blind man's eyes and his eyes are open so he can see. And the result is that he believes that Jesus is the Son. If you keep going on in John's gospel to chapters 14 to 16, he says lots about the Spirit. Basic summary, the Spirit's main work is to testify about Jesus, to convict you of the truth that Jesus is the Christ. Let me give you two examples that might help us to think about two different ways in this anointing does this. One is that one morning I woke up in Spain and had gunk all in my eye. It was all puffed out and I was freaking out. There's all this gunk in my eye. I don't want to go to the hospital. I don't want to see a doctor that's going to speak Spanish and I won't understand. Tanya calms me down and says, it's probably just conjunctivitis. Let's get some saline and wash it out. So she anointed me and washed out the gunk so that I could see again. God's spirit reveals to us by wiping away the gunk, by helping us recognize that all those other stories are false. Let me tell you about another anointing. This is with my mum. She came and visited us in Spain when one of our babies had had been born and offered to change our baby's nappy. Thanks, mum. Great, she takes him off and then we hear this blood-curdling scream. It's not the baby, it was my mum. <laughs> so she's gone and taken off his nappy and my baby starts smiling, of course, and she smiles back and just goes, ha, 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 and then wee, straight in her mouth. <laughs> she was anointed. <laughs> but let me tell you what that anointing did. It revealed to her a new truth that she has never forgotten, and that is that you never Open your mouth when changing a boy's nappy. Lessons for life. The Spirit anoints you with a new truth, that Jesus is the Christ. And if you believe that, it is nothing short of a miracle. And as you acknowledge Jesus as the Christ and change kingdoms, God gives you a new title, a new identity. Chapter 3, verse 1, see what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. You're reborn. How much better is that than a like on your Instagram story? This is your real story. A child of God who acknowledges Jesus as their king, their Christ. You stop loving the world. You deny the lie that says there can be any other ruler. And you live his story. And you trust in his word because that's who you really are. You were born to remain in the Christ. But that means you can no longer be a child of the devil. That's who we were. And that's how strongly John puts it. If you are a child of God living with Jesus as your king, then you need to clearly hear the fourth supporting idea that a child of the devil rejects Jesus as their king. You see it in chapter 3, verse 10. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother and sister. But like we saw last night, we don't go around looking for anyone who tells a lie and saying, lawbreaker, child of the devil, antichrist. No. The actions are just the symptoms, right? But they usually, they might be revealing something of what the true identity is that drives them. Verses three to four help us. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Those who are children of God, that is, they they live it out. They're starting to live with Jesus as their king. But everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. Do you know what sin is? It's a bit of a jargon word, right? It's not just what you do. Those are the expressions of sin that we often call sins. But you see what it says here? Sin is lawlessness. It means you're lawless. You reject law. It means that you're the boss. You're the king. You're rejecting God as king. So I wonder if, in fact, maybe that's a better way of describing it, especially to our friends, of saying that it's rejecting God. 
maybe we could say that sometimes instead of saying bullying is a sin. You could say bullying is rejecting God. Or look at how it helps us maybe understand verse 8. The one who lives rejecting God is of the devil because the devil has been rejecting God from the beginning. See, rejecting God puts it in that category of identity. You're in a different kingdom. So what if I make a mistake? Verse 5 to 6. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins. And in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. He's asking you if you know who you really are. If you're a child of God, you acknowledge Jesus as your king. You're in him. So he has taken away your rejection of God. That's why he died on the cross, to take what you deserved as a God rejecter. But that means that you've now changed kingdoms. You've taken off your crown and you've laid it at Jesus' feet. So you're no longer lawless. You remain with Jesus as your king. You, you purify yourself as you start to live like him. So I think someone who's in Jesus' kingdom might still make mistakes. The lag on from their old kingdom. I don't think John is saying that if you've slipped up, you're out. But here's some questions to help you work out who you are. Are you ready to confront your sins, those expressions of your rejection of God? Do you confess them to others? Do you wrestle with those temptations? Are you changing? All those things are part of purifying yourselves to be like him who is pure, of living with Jesus as your king. But John is saying that if you continue rejecting Jesus as king, you haven't really joined his kingdom. And maybe that's you. You'll know it. You've been pretty good at hiding it from those around you. But you know that deep down you've been running life your own way for a long time. You've still been rejecting him as your king. And it means that you still stand as a child of the devil. Because you haven't changed kingdoms. Please look again at Jesus Look at what he did for you, how he died for you, how he rules so much better than you. And acknowledge him as your king. He's waiting to forgive you, to lavish his love on you and call you a child of God. That is who you can be. Tell someone if you want to do that. The real story of life is to live for Jesus. Living for anything other than him is a false story and that's why a child of God lives with Jesus as their king but a child of the devil rejects Jesus as their king. So what's your story? You were born to remain in the Christ. What's that going to look like as you face your world of doubts? Maybe it'll look something like Sarai. She's a teenager we met in Spain at uh, the national camp. She was in uh, one of my small groups. She'd just become a Christian, was about 15. Um, and she was doing it tough. She, her family wasn't Christian. She was the only Christian at her school. She was trying to live life like Jesus, but finding it really difficult when she was mocked and when there were so many other temptations around. So uh, she went back after camp with, with being really keen to try and start something in her school, but just hit wall after wall. And so eventually came to a pretty radical decision, which was to change schools. Because she knew who she was, forgiven in Jesus, a child of God. And so that meant that her self at school didn't need to define her, what her friends thought about her, what her school said of her, all her achievements there, none of that defined her. But she was determined then that as she started at this new school that she was going to be boldly Christian from day one, saying she was a child of God. She was confident in the message she had heard from the beginning that the word of God lived in her. And so she was strong. And God was really kind in giving her a few Christians who were at this new school who she met. But she, again, coming off camp, was like, well, it's obvious what we're going to do. We're going to get together and start reading the Bible together. So she started up a group just off her own bat. And then they kept inviting others and, and more and more started joining this group until there was 23 of them. This is in a high school in Madrid when just not much is happening. It's impossible. But God did this through her. She's just finished school. She's excited about sharing Jesus in her university now. 
of continuing to overcome as she looks towards persevering in Jesus. And I say all of this to you, LIT campus, because as a child of God, you are strong. And the word of God lives in you. And you have overcome the evil one. I'm going to pray quickly. And then I'd like you to take a minute to reflect over what we've seen. Maybe pray yourself a bit. And then we'll come back together. Let's pray and then a minute of reflection time. Father, in Jesus, we are your children. Thank you for the forgiveness we have on account of Jesus' name. Thank you that we know you as our Father. Please strengthen us by your word who lives in us that we might overcome the evil one. And so at Jesus coming, boldly say we know you from the beginning. Help us all to remain in the Christ and so overcome. In Jesus' name. Amen.